questions and answers. He has quite the background. He has a full practice in Maine with um, over 18,000 patients. Um, he has studied with the Lakota Medicine Chief. He's very much into Tai Chi. He um, founder of uh, Integral Eight Health. He is in the integrative health practices and treats, like I said, over 18,000 patients with medical cannabis. He is also on healer.com. You can go and look that up where he gives different classes. And um, through that, he tells you different ways of different issues. One of the ones that I'm particularly infatuated with is his pediatric and uh, pediatric seizures. It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, long uh, four segment video to watch if you have children with seizures. These are all of his specialties. Pain medicine, integrative medicine, hypnosis, family medicine, geriatrics medicine. He likes to get to know his patients. He works more like uh, the way you do natural pass work. You know, they try to get you to adjust your body and your lifestyle and instead of throwing a bunch of drugs at you. And he is leading, um, he has policies about replacing opiates with cannabis. And that is what is um, that is what today's presentation is about. We have a really big problem here in Shasta County um, with opiate addiction, with um, people being put on opiates for a very, very long time, and then all of a sudden, um, they do a little bit of cannabis, and then their doctor cuts them off all pain meds. And that has become a very big problem. Or the abuse of pain medication. We have quite a bit of that which leads to other things because when they go to abuse that, well then we know they start getting into very much harder drugs and it's just a downhill spiral. And we will have him on in one second. Ready? There we go.
to pediatrics, usually with severe neurologic conditions. And at the time, there was no testing uh, analytic facility for cannabis in Maine. And so I really uh, had the need to start one up, even though it wasn't necessarily my area of expertise, because I was having parents come in holding up a bottle of unlabeled tincture and saying, how many drops of this should I give to my child who's seasoned? And I wanted to know what's in there and what, what was the potency. And so we, uh, we started testing labs to help with our pediatric population. But um, it's been really wonderful to have the analytics on site in the medical practice because patients are constantly bringing in things that are working for them or that aren't working for them. And we're really learning a lot about cannabis dosing and the various constituents of cannabis uh, to, to continue to discover what's the best way to use this herb that has just so many gifts for our humanity. I still think we're just scratching the surface. And then finally, I started a patient education website, healer.com, which basically took all the educational efforts we were doing in our clinic and made them available to everyone all over the world for free. So we have programs on healer.com to uh, take someone who's brand new to cannabis and walk them through it. We have a shopping guide for what to do with the dispensary. We have a program for existing users who uh, want to lower their dosage and get better results people who want to have a non-psychoactive experience, and so forth. And so I'll share some of that information with you today when we talk about specifically how to use cannabis for patients that are currently using opioids or for people that want to stay away from them. So here's the overview. Uh, the opioid problem, I'll just describe uh, some of the statistics about the problem. And then um, these are the points that I'm making. Number one, cannabis can replace and reduce opioids. Adding cannabis makes opioids safer. Cannabis prevents opioid tolerance and the need for dose escalation. It can treat the symptoms of opioid withdrawal. It is better compared to other harm reduction options, safer at least. And how to use cannabis to decrease and discontinue opioids. I'll offer some practical advice. Um, and most of what I've learned, I've learned from my patients who have been successful. So the opioid problem, to begin with, uh, 44 people in the United States die every day from prescription painkiller overdose. That's just prescriptions. When we include heroin, it goes up to around 70 people every day. 7,000 people treated in the emergency room every day, again, for just prescription opioid misuse. One in 20 in the United States, age 12 and older, have used prescription painkillers done medically uh, and that was back in 2010, so it's probably gone up a bit since then. One in 20 people using prescriptions either otherwise up than they were um, prescribed or using someone else's pills. The sales of opioid pills in this country between 1999 and 2010 quadrupled. Between that, uh, 2000 and uh, 2014, the rates of death also quadrupled. And this, again, is just from prescription painkillers. Enough opioids were prescribed in 2010 to medicate every American adult with a standard dosage of 5 milligrams of hydrocodone every four hours for a month. Every adult in the U.S. could be taking a month's worth of hydrocodone. That's how much we're prescribing here. There is a huge social and economic impact of the opioid problem. This study looked at uh, the expense to employers of the opioid problem. They found that the opioid, that opioid abuse overall cost the U.S. economy $56 billion a year. And so just to put that into perspective, in 2008, the U.N. released data on what it would cost to end world hunger, basically to end starvation around the world, would cost $10 billion a year. And if we did that, or if we pay ten billion dollars a year for, I believe it was eight years in a row, then we would have a sustainable solution that would continue to solve the hunger problem here and now. No more starvation in the world. Wouldn't that change things? So we're spending fifty-six billion dollars a year on our health problem here. One out of every three prescriptions that's being handed out by pharmacies is being abused. Baby boomers are four times more likely to abuse prescriptions than millennials, 
And uh, the geography is somewhat heterogeneous around um, where the use is taking place, but it's really all over, more concentrated in southern states. And here's another map that shows. But these uh, data by states aren't um, that addictive of what our experience would be because there's uh, certain urban areas where we could have really high use, say in California, even though overall the state is in the lowest uh, quartile of opioid uh, prescriptions. These are just how many prescriptions are being written, not necessarily how much abuse is going on. So America is consuming nearly the world's whole supply of opioid medications. We have less than 5% of the world's population, yet we consume 80% of the world's opioid supply. That was back in 2008. It's actually gone up quite a bit since then. That's just staggering. There's countries that can't afford or can't find access to opioids, even for basic uses like post-surgical care and end-of-life care. Um, we're, we're really paying most for it and using it the most. And so the people who make opioids are happy to send it up here to us. Nearly 50% of the patients in this country who took opioids for more than 30 days in the first year of use continue to use them for three years or longer. Half of the people from this study uh, were taking only short-acting opioids, which puts them at higher risk for addiction and 60% of them were taking opioids with another drug, like the benzodiazepine, uh, that, whose combination could be potentially fatal. And I don't have the statistics, but quite a few of the opioid overdose deaths aren't just the opioids, they're due to combination of opioids and uh, drugs in the class of diet. This prescription problem often leads to heroin. 79.5% of heroin users reported using prescription opioids before initiating heroin use. And 45% of people who use heroin are concurrently addicted to the prescription. So what I really want to drive home is that even though heroin is a big problem, the real problem starts in the doctor's office. These are too many prescriptions that are being written. Those prescriptions are being abused. And then when people lose access to the pill, they often turn to the next um, less expensive alternative that's often readily available, and that's heroin. But this isn't a problem that starts with heroin dealers. This is a problem that starts with doctors. And doctors are prescribing a lot of opioids to treat chronic pain. So um, it's uh, a worthwhile question to ask, do opioids help with chronic pain? We know that opioids are great for acute pain, they're good for post-surgical pain, they're good for end-of-life pain. But we actually don't even have any evidence to decide whether or not they're good for chronic pain. Here's a review from 2015, Annals of Internal Medicine, that concluded, evidence is insufficient to determine the effectiveness of long-term opioid therapy for improving chronic pain and function. And of course, an improvement in function is the goal of treating chronic pain. So they looked at 34 studies and found that none of them evaluated the long-term outcomes for more than a year. But they did find serious harms associated with long-term opioid treatment, even when the treatment was being taken as directed. Overdose, opioid abuse, fractures, heart attacks, sexual dysfunction, other hormonal uh, dysfunction, and so really, opioids aren't a good treatment for chronic pain. They, it, what this uh, slide doesn't mention is that they tend to make chronic pain worse. They'll treat it for a little while, and the patient will feel some relief, but then that relief will wear off, and they'll need more and more opioids, what we call dose escalation. And even though they're getting more opioids, the baseline of their pain has actually worsened over time, and their body's inherent capacity to diminish the pain becomes lost. And so we start seeing things like hyperalgesia, which is a very intense, uh, hypersensitive state to pain, and allodynia, where touches or um, you know, sensations that would normally not be painful become painful. So what about cannabis? On the other hand, there's quite a bit of good data showing that cannabis does help with chronic non-cancer pain. This is a review from last year that looked at 11 studies published between 2010 and 2014 
that included 1,100 patients. They were excellent quality trials. And seven out of those 11 demonstrated that cannabinoids exhibited an analgesic effect that was significantly better than the placebo. The drug-related adverse effects were primarily fatigue, dizziness, dry mouth, nausea, and disturbances in cognition, basically getting high. Uh, they were mild to moderate. They didn't last very long. They were generally well tolerated. So much better side effect profile than the opioids and better efficacy. This review, of, uh, the findings were consistent with the previous review from four years prior. And when you look at those two review articles together, we have a total of 22 out of 29 high quality gold standard trials, a randomized and controlled trial, showing that cannabinoids are a good option in the management of chronic pain. Yet, even 